Good morning, Angie, for you. We're going to get right into Act 1, Scene 3 today. We get a, a closer look at Polonius and his family. So let's talk right about the, uh, the summary here. This scene familiarizes us with Polonius's family. Laertes is about to leave for France and is saying goodbye to his sister Ophelia. He takes the opportunity to warn her about her romance with Hamlet. Polonius arrives and gives Laertes advice about how to behave in France. Once Laertes has departed, Polonius also warns Ophelia that Hamlet's intentions may not be honorable. And he tells her to avoid him. After attempting to defend her relationship with Hamlet to Polonius, Ophelia accepts her father's advice. And this, ex this kind of establishes her character as being somewhat of a puppet in this play. Yeah. All right, so let's get right into it. My necessaries are embarked. Farewell. And sister, as the winds give benefit and convoy is assistant, do not sleep but let me hear from you. Do you doubt that? For Hamlet and the trifling of his favors, hold it a fashion and a toy in blood, a violet in the youth of primy nature, froward, not permanent, sweet, not lasting, the perfume and suppliance of a minute. Okay, so again here we have um, some reference to garden um, flowers, right? So he says here, don't, don't take it really seriously. It's a brief little dalliance. It's a brief little pleasure. He's just being impulsive. I know him. He's going to go on to say, I went to school with him, right? They, they were in school together. That's how they're chums. They went to Wittenberg together. Um, Laertes... Uh, is going to go back, but uh, Hamlet, we know, has been convinced to stay back in uh, in Denmark. So he's saying to her, look, he, I wouldn't trust him. I know the guy. He means it now, but he's got some other bigger responsibilities that might interfere with a relationship with you. You're not on his level of status, right? And status at that time was a really huge contributing factor. No more. No more, but so? Think it no more. For nature crescent does not grow alone in thews and bulk. But as this temple waxes, the inward service of the mind and soul grows wide with all. Perhaps he loves you now. And now no soil nor cortle doth besmirch the virtue of his will. But you must fear. His greatness weighed, his will is not his own. For he himself is subject to his birth. He may not, as unvalued persons do, carve for himself. For on his choice depends the sanctity and health of this whole state. And therefore must his choice be circumscribed unto the voice and yielding of that body, whereof he is the head. Then if he says he loves you, it fits your wisdom so far to believe it. All right, so he's saying here, listen, um... <coughs> He has some greater responsibilities. He may indeed love you right now, but in the future, he's not able to make his own decisions. He needs to get approval from those, uh, those people ahead of him, those people who are higher than him. Uh, he'll need to consider his high position. If, however, he gets to that high position and then says he loves you, Laertes says, that's a different story. But right now, I wouldn't place too much um, emphasis on, you know, on the truth of it. So he says, wait until he is able to make his own decisions himself, then believe it. As he in his particular act and place may give his saying deed, which is no further than the main voice of Denmark goes with all. All right, so he is not offensive here. He has some genuine concern for her. He sincerely believes that class differences will doom Ophelia's future with Hamlet. She can only endanger her, her virtue by responding to his interest. And her father, Polonius, is going to reiterate this same concern. So it's not like he's trying to be mean to her. He's really, truly concerned about her. Yes, yeah, Sarah? What is her virtue? Her virtue is her virginity. Yes. So he is concerned that she is going to um, do something that will, that will make her less pure. Even if she doesn't actually give up her virginity to him, you know, certain acts would definitely make her less pure 
And he's really concerned about that. Then weigh what loss your honor may sustain. If with too credent ear you list his songs or lose your heart, or your chaste treasure open to his unmastered importunity. Okay, so he's, he's referring right here. He's saying, so you need to weigh your options here. If, um, if you are sucked into this, right, with his charm, he's very charming. If you get sucked in or you lose your heart to him and you, your chaste treasure open, literally, your virginity, um, he says, to his unmastered opportunity, you may have your, um, your uh, values compromised, right? You're going to make yourself look like you're cheap. And he's really concerned. He, does, he loves his sister. It's a really genuine, caring, uh, loving uh, relationship. Fear it, Ophelia. Fear it, my dear sister. And keep within the rear of your affection, out of the shot and danger of desire. The cheriest maid is prodigal enough if she unmask her beauty to the moon. <laughs> Virtue itself scapes not calumnious strokes. The canker galls the infants of the spring too oft before their buttons be disclosed. And in the morn and liquid dew of youth, contagious blastments are most imminent. Be wary then. Best safety lies in fear. Youth to itself rebels, though none else near. All right, so let's get uh, take a look up here. He's making a reference again to um, to flowers growing, and this is connected to the, the unweeded garden or the poisonous uh, um, atmosphere in in Denmark. So he says here, if you lose your virtue, it'll it, it's easy to do because there will be gossip. Uh, calamitous strokes, gossip, evil gossip about you. And he's comparing it to how the canker, a canker worm, too often destroys early spring flowers, even before they blossom. So he's comparing it to her virginity, her virtue, right? Like you might lose something really beautiful and not even be able to blossom. I shall the effect of this good lesson keep as watchman to my heart. But good my brother, do not as some ungracious pastors do, show me the steep and thorny way to heaven, whilst like a puffed and reckless libertine, himself the primrose path of dalliance treads, and wrecks not his own reed. Ooh, so she throws it back on him. She says, okay, look, I'll take what you say into consideration, but you're kind of a hypocrite there, buddy. Uh, why are you telling me to watch how carefully I tread when I know that you are like a libertine, a player yourself. So you yourself are walking a, a pretty s steep little road yourself, she says. So, so she kind of calls him on it, right? And wrecks not his own read. So uh, um, you, you're not taking your own advice and wrecks not his own read. You're, you're not taking your own advice. And so to this, he's going to say, zing, all right, I'd best not uh, pursue this conversation with you anymore. Fear me not. I stay too long. Oh, but here my father comes. Ah. A double blessing is a double grace. Occasion smiles upon a second leave. And yet here lay at least aboard, aboard for shame. The wind sits at the shoulder of your sail and, and you are stayed for. There, my blessing with thee. Okay, what are you doing still here, Laertes? The, the, the wind for your ship is here. It's a, it would be a good time to leave. And then he says, but wait, before you leave, I want to give you some advice. And he does. He lists it. Yeah, and these few precepts in thy memory, see thou character. So again, these few precepts, this is my advice. See for your character when you go away to France. Number one, give thy thoughts no tongue. So watch what you say. And you know what? We'll go through all of them, and then I'll go back and list them for you. Give thy thoughts no tongue, nor any unproportioned thought his act. Two. Be thou familiar, but by no means vulgar. Three. The friends thou hast, and their adoption tried, grapple them to thy soul with hoops of steel. Four. But do not dull thy palm with entertainment of each unhatched, unfledged comrade. Five. Beware of entrance to a quarrel, but being in, bear that the opposed may beware of thee. Seven. Give every man thy ear, but few thy voice. Eight and nine. Take each man's censure, but reserve thy judgment. Costly thy habit as thy purse can buy, but not expressed in fancy. Rich, not gaudy. 
10, to the 11. apparel of proclaims the man, and they in France of the best rank and station, or most select and generous, chief in that. 11. Mm -hmm. Neither a 12. borrower nor a lender be. 13. For loan oft loses both itself and friend, and borrowing dulls the edge of husbandry. Mm. This above all, to thine own self be true, and it must follow 14. as the night the day, thou canst not then be false to any man. Farewell. My blessing season is in the year. 14. So, he's got a lot of advice for him, but it's important to go through it. And it's, it's typical father or parent advice. So, number one, he says, um, watch what you say. Number two, watch what you do. Number three, don't swear. Number four, stay with trusted friends. Five, but choose your friends wisely. Number six, don't be too trusting of them. Number seven, don't get in fights. Number eight, but don't let people walk all over you either. Nine, listen to everyone, but follow no one. Number 10, listen to opinions, do not judge. 11, don't overspend. 12, uh, don't, don't overspend on dressing on your dressing, don't dress gaudy, but make sure you dress appropriately. And then he says, the French will judge you on your appearance. So it's kind of like a balancing act. Don't spend too much and look gaudy, but make sure you spend just enough and look presentable, because those French people will judge you on how you look. 13, don't borrow money from people and definitely do not lend it. And he says, it will break up friendships. Uh, number 14, above all, listen to your conscience. To thine own self be true. Then you can be truthful with everyone. And then the last thing is, uh, he says, listen to me, don't be dumb, basically. Um, I give you good advice here. If you listen to me, then you will have a really good life. This is really good advice, and it is. Humbly do I take my leave, my lord. The time invites you. Go, your servants ten. Farewell, Ophelia. And remember well what I have said to you. It is in my memory locked, and you yourself shall keep the key of it. Okay, so again, this uh, really supports the genuine caring relationship that they do that they do have, right? I will uh, listen to what you've said, and I will keep it very close to me. In fact, you hold the key to it. Farewell. What is it, Ophelia, he has said to you? So please you, something touching the Lord Hamlet. Mary, well be thought. Just tell me he hath very oft of late given private time to you, and you yourself have of your audience been most free and bounteous. If it be so, uh, uh, so it is put on me, uh, that in way of caution, I must tell you, you do not understand yourself so clearly as it behoves my daughter and your honour. What is between you? Give me up the truth. Ooh, he's nosy. So he says, well, I thought it might have something to do with Hamlet because I've heard some rumors. Yeah, tis told to me that he has of late spent some private time with you and that you yourself has been very available to him, um, given lots of your time to him. Now, if this is true, as it was told to me, as the rumor was told to me, um, you better you know, you better be open and honest with me. He he makes her feel, though, like she's not able to make her own decisions. And again, that was really indicative of the time. The men, it was very patriarchal and misogynistic. And um, and you know from Midsummer Night's Dream that the fathers had a lot of power over their children. So what is it that's going on? And you better tell me the truth, he says. He hath, my lord, of late made many tenders of his affection to me. Affection? Pooh, you speak like a green girl, and sifted in such perilous circumstance. Do you believe his tenders, as you call them? All right, so it's important to note here that Polonius is punning on some words that are connected to money. He seems less worried about her feelings and more worried. He, he, his, his values are, his priorities are, are not maybe the best. He, he values money um, and um, his um, 
you know, how people think about him um, over her feelings for sure. And not only that, he chastises her. He makes her feel like she's not able to make her own decisions for sure. So let's take a look here. He said, Ophelia says, he hath my lord of late made many tenders, offers. So tender could refer to money as well. So she's, he's going to say you, he, an offer, but the offer that he made you wasn't with real money. And so he's, he's suggesting that it's not real love, right? So not real love, punning on that. And then a little bit later here, um, do you believe his tenders, as you call him? So he's saying that he's giving you credit notes, like IOUs, basically, instead of real money. His offers aren't, you know, real, basically. I do not know, my lord, what I should think. Mary, I'll teach you. Think yourself a baby, that you have taken his tenders for true pay, which are not sterling. All right, so again, um, referring to this... Uh, um, this metaphor of money, that the tenders are money. It's like money. So she, he, she says, uh, oh, I don't know. I'm dumb. And Polonius says, oh, don't worry. You're like a little baby and I'll, I'll tell you what to think. Uh, you're so naive, you know, in this particular subject area. And so she's, you know, yes, I kind of am. So he's going to go on to say, you should value yourself more. The tender that he's given you Again, it's just credit notes. It's like an IOU. He should be giving you sterling, silver coins. So in Polonius's opinion, he's not being genuine, right? Tender yourself more dearly. Value yourself more. And then he's going to go on to say, um, uh, make sure you tender yourself more dearly. Value yourself more. Or not to crack the wind of the poor phrase. So he says, don't be like the saying, running it thus, you'll tender me a fool. So he's talking about, um, well, let's look to the side here. Not to crack phrase, not to overwork the pun like a horse that's been ridden too hard. Yes, that's sexual innuendo. All right, so he's saying, you know, I don't want you to be a hussy. Tender yourself more dearly. Oh, not to crack the wind of the poor phrase, roaming it thus, you tender me a fool. My lord, he hath importuned me with love in honorable fashion. In <laughs> fashion, you may call it. Go to, go to. And hath given countenance to his speech, my lord, with all the vows of heaven. Aye, springes to catch woodcocks. I do know when the blood burns how prodigal the soul lends the tongue vows. Okay, so here she's saying, I disagree with you. He has not been cheap in his words. He's been very sincere. And he has sworn to me by God in the heavens that this is really truly how he feels. He's honorable, Father. And he's like, you know nothing. Go to, go to. You know nothing. You. It is like um, this... Uh, uh, comparison here. I springs to catch woodcocks. I do know when the blood burns how easy the soul gives, um, gives out promises. So let's take a look in the annotations here. Woodcocks were considered to be stupid birds that could be caught easily in snares. So he's telling her, basically, she's kind of stupid. You don't know what you're doing. You're too easy prey, basically. Um, you, you fall too easily. You'll be easy prey. And then he says, for sure, when the blood boils, when there's lust in somebody's heart, they're going to easily tell you what you want to hear, right? These blazes, daughter, giving more light than heat, extinct in both, even in their promises it is a making, you must not take for fire. From this time be something scanter of your maiden presence. Set your entreatments at a higher rate than a command to parley. Okay, so this is appearance versus reality. He is saying, um, do not interpret these blazing promises as, you know, real true fire. It's, um, it's giving more light than there is heat to it. So it looks like it's, you know, maybe true love, but it isn't. Appearance versus reality, again, right? So he has some advice for her too. 
he's a bit of a know-it-all. So he says, um, this is what you need to do, dear. You need to make sure from this time forward that you do not make yourself too available for him. If he comes to look to you, uh, look for you to talk to him, uh, a command to parlay, to talk to him, make sure that you are not too available, that you hide away, in fact, go hide from him. Um, and with a larger tether, may he walk, then may be given you. He has more freedom than you do. In other words, he can, you don't know who else he's making these promises to. He has a larger tether, free range. In a few words, Ophelia, do not believe his vows. They are brokers. So again, re referring to money. A broker is somebody who's trying to sell you something um, or agents that try to sell you something. They appear innocent, but they're designed to trick you. Agents, brokers. For Lord Hamlet believes so much in him that he is young and with a larger tether may he walk than may be given you. In few, Ophelia, do not believe his vows, for they are brokers, not of that dye which their investments show, but mere implorators of unholy suits, breathing like sanctified and pious bonds the better to beguile. Okay, so again, carrying on with this comparison that he has given you notes of um, IOUs and the investment isn't a good investment. So it's like she's money to him. Um, so again, he may, ha you know, breathe pious bonds, again, a pun, looks like a good marriage bond, a bond can be money too, investing in money, but he's saying it's not a good investment, it, 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 he's, he's going to break his, it's, his, uh, his promises. This is for all. I would not, in plain terms, from this time forth, have you so slander any moment's leisure as to give words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. <laughs> Look to it, I charge you. Come your ways. We shall obey, my lord. Okay, so we've already mentioned that she is a bit of a puppet in this play, and we see it right here. She doesn't have a choice. And the reality is, daughters did not at this time, right? It was very patriarchal. So he says to her, from this point on, you are not to give him any more of your leisure time, nor are you to give him words or talk with the Lord Hamlet. I demand it. And she says, I shall obey. So she has no choice. All right, let's uh, keep going here to act one, scene four. In this scene, in this scene, 24 hours have passed since the ghost appeared in scene one. Hamlet, Horatio, and Marcellus are on the platform of the castle, waiting for the ghost to reappear. In the background, the blaring of trumpets and the sound of cannons, cannons being fired announce each drink the king takes as he carouses the night through the night. When the ghost appears, Hamlet questions it. The ghost beckons Hamlet to follow. Despite his friend's warnings, Hamlet ignores the possible dangers and follows the ghost. We're not surprised, right? We're not surprised because he already announced that should hell stand in his way, nothing would stop him. Okay, so let's get to scene four. On the platform, enter Hamlet, Horatio, and Marcellus. <laughs> air bite shrewdly. It is very cold. It is a nipping and an eager air. What hour now? I think it lacks of twelve. Oh, it is struck. Indeed? I heard it not. And it draws near the season wherein the spirit held his wont to walk. So again, setting the mood here. It is cold and bitter, right? Although it's maybe spring, it is still cold. Um, it's He, he doesn't think it's uh, midnight, but uh, Marcella says, no, no, yeah, it's past midnight. So they say, okay. 
What does this mean, my lord? The king doth wake tonight, takes his rouse, keeps wassail and the swaggering up spring reels. And as he drains his drafts of Rhenish down, the kettle drum and trumpet thus bray out the triumph of his pledge. All right, so Horatio's like, what is that? What's going on here? A flourish of trumpets uh, either indicates that the monarchy is either arriving somewhere or leaving somewhere. So he must be arriving to the celebration. And Hamlet says, I'll tell you what it means. It means that my uncle, the king, um, is celebrating tonight. He's drinking heavily. Um, he is uh, doing a lot of toasts and he is um, it, encouraging dancing, wild dancing, as he drains the wine, the Rhenish down. The kettle drum and trumpet thus bray out the trump, triumph of his pledge, announcing every drink he takes. So um, Horatio says, is it a custom? Is that tradition? And he says, oh yeah, yeah it is. But Hamlet's going to go on to say, it's a custom that he thinks is better not practiced. He's going to um, suggest some things about his uncle that give us some indication of how he feels about the decisions his uncle is making here. Is it a custom? I marry is. But to my mind, though I am native here under the manner born, it is a custom more honored in the breach than the observance. This heavy-headed rebel, east and west, makes us traduced and taxed of other nations. They keep us drunkards, and with swinish phrase, soil our addition. Okay, so he says, I disagree with this. Um, there are enough rumors about us being heavy drinkers, and, you know, other people, other countries call us drunks, and those Danes are pigs, right, because they drink so much and party so much. Um, so they clape us, they call us drunkards, and with swinish phrase, they call us pigs. And he says, uh, it soils our good name. So if Hamlet were ever to be king, he would, he would be a different kind of king. He's suggesting here that the current king, his uncle, Claudius, is arrogant. And indeed it takes from our achievements, though performed at height, the pith and marrow of our attribute. Yeah, it reduces our so reputation. So chances in particular men but for some vicious mold of nature in them, as in their birth, wherein they are not guilty, since nature cannot choose his origin, by the ore growth of some complexion. Of okay, so I'm going to stop it there because he's suggesting here that sometimes undeserving people come to power. He's talking about his uncle, for sure. And then he says, uh, that's for some vicious mole of nature. A mole is an animal that is... In underground and he you know digs holes and he ruins gardens so again a little reference here to that uh, you know a poisonous garden or an unweeded garden he is comparing his uncle Claudius to a mole and he will uh, reiterate re reiterate that a little bit later too it's not a pleasant thing to say about somebody yeah so um, then he's gonna go on to say um, they may be you know, some people are undeserving. He's obviously talking about his uncle. And then he says, but, you know, sometimes it's not their fault. Since nature cannot choose his origin by the overgrowth of some complexion. We're going to take a look at the uh, annotation here. Or growth of some complexion. In Shakespeare's time, it was believed that human nature was governed by four fluids in the body. So, they are blood, black bile, yellow bile and phlegm. Too much of any one fluid would change a person's temperament, making him or her sanguine, like optimistic, melancholic, uh, choleric, like irritable, or phlegmatic, kind of calm and unemotional. So he's saying, you know, yeah, people come to power that they, they don't really deserve it. And uh, sometimes it's not even their fault how they're acting because it's all within their body. Maybe they have too much phlegm or too much black bile or something. So he, he is talking about his uncle. He is suspicious of his uncle. It's breaking down the pales and forts of reason or by some habit that too much or leavens the form of plausive manners that these men, carrying, I say, the stamp of one defect, 
being nature's livery or fortune's star, their virtues else, be they as pure as grace, as infinite as man may undergo, shall in the general censure take corruption from that particular fault. Okay, so he's saying here that it might lead to um, a defect, a defect in their character. We know what that is. We call that a tragic flaw. So he's saying it might not even be their fault that they have this tragic flaw. Maybe they're too uh, greedy. Maybe, you know, whatever it is, it leads to a tragic flaw. This small defect ruins their whole personality. Um, and again, this is all, like he's, he's mentioning um, of the poison garden image throughout this as well. So, and then he's gonna end off the dram of evil. A little bit of evil is enough to bring him to his downfall or destruction. And we know that that's what happens in tragedy, right? There's a tragic flaw and it brings you down to your destruction. The dram of evil doth all the noble substance of a doubt to his own scandal. Look, my lord, it comes. Angels and ministers of grace, defend us. Be thou a spirit of health, or goblin damned, bring with thee airs from heaven or blasts from hell, be thy intent wicked or charitable, thou comest in such a questionable shape that I will speak to thee. I'll call thee Hamlet, King, Father, Royal Dane. Oh, answer me. Let me not burst in ignorance, but tell why thy canonized bones hurted in death that broke their settlements. Why the sepulchre wherein we saw thee quietly and earned evoked his ponderous and marble jaws to cast thee up again? What may this mean, that thou dead course, again in complete steel, revisits thus the glimpses of the moon, making night hideous, and we fools of nature so horridly to shake our dispositions with thoughts beyond the reaches of our souls? Say, why is this? Wherefore? What should we do? Okay, so Hamlet, uh, right at the very beginning, he says, angels and ministers defend us. He's not sure. So it is a prayer for protection and an incantation against evil. He's uncertain whether he can trust the ghost, and he doesn't know whether it's good or bad or evil, right? This uncertainty continues throughout the play. He's not sure whether he should actually trust this ghost. Very similar to how Macbeth should have been um, less trusting of the witches. So, um, so he then he goes on to say, in full armor, protecting himself. Why is, why is um, my father showing up in full armor? Why is he protecting himself? And then he goes on, right on to say, we humans do not know all the secrets of the universe. Um, we are like fools. So he says to the ghost, uh, why is it that you that you have come here? I don't know all the answers. The ghost beckons Hamlet to continue. So Horatio. It beckons you to go away with it. As if it's some impartment of desire to you alone. Look with what courteous action it wafts you to a more removing ground. But do not go with it. No, by no means. It will not speak, then I will follow it. Do not, my lord. Why, what should be the fear? I do not set my life at a pin's fee. And for my soul, what can it do to that, being a thing immortal as itself? It waves me forth again. I'll follow it. What if it tempt you toward the flood, my lord? Or to the dreadful summit of the cliff that beetles o'er his base into the sea and there assume some other horrible form which might deprive your sovereignty of reason and draw you into madness? Think of it. The very place puts toys of desperation without more motive into every brain that looks so many fathoms to the sea and hears it roar beneath. It wafts me still. Go on. I'll follow thee. You shall not go, my lord. Hold off your hands. No. You shall not go. My fate cries out. And makes each pity arter in this body as hardy as the Nemean lion's nerve. So am I called? Unhand me, gentlemen. By heaven, I'll make a ghost of him that lets me. I say, away! Go on. I'll follow thee. Desperate with imagination. Let's follow. It is not fit thus to obey him. Have after. 
to what is will this come? Something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Heaven will direct it. Hey, let's follow him. All right, so uh, Hamlet says, it, it won't speak to me, but I, I'm going to follow it and see if it will speak to me. And they say, don't, don't do that, my lord. What if it's going to lead you off a cliff or, you know, drown you somehow? You don't know. You shouldn't be trusting it. And he says, I don't care. My life isn't worth a pin. And I, my soul is indestructible. So I'm not worried about that, he says. And then Horatio says, no, 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 no. What if it tempts you toward the flood and it drowns you or off a cliff? Um, it can shape shift maybe into a monster. We don't know. And, and then Horatio says, it might uh, draw you into madness. Now, this is dramatic irony because we know that he is going to all, well, we know we know that that is true. The very place puts toys of desperation without more motive into the brain. You are desperate to talk to your father. Maybe it's taking advantage of that and wants to kill you. And those are good concerns. Hamlet says, I don't care. Go on, I'll follow thee. And then he says to his friends, listen, you don't dare follow me. If you do, I'll make ghosts of you. Okay, and then Horatio says, uh, look, he's not in his right mind. He's nuts. We're going to follow him anyway. He's not in his right mind. Marcellus says this uh, famous line, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Okay, and that is, nope, it's not. So we're going to continue on here with Act 1, Scene 5. There we go. The ghost tells Hamlet that he was murdered by Claudius. He accuses Claudius and Gertrude of having an adulterous relationship before his death, and he describes exactly how he was poisoned. The ghost commands Hamlet to take revenge for these wrongs. Hamlet is horrified by all that he learns and swears to heed the ghost's commands. When he is joined by Horatio and Marcellus, he does not reveal what the ghost told him. As his friends try to calm him, he forces them to swear secrecy about what they have seen. So again, more alienation here. Scene five, a more remote part of the platform, enter Ghost and Hamlet. go back to purgatory so that's where he's saying he is so I'm just gonna um, give you some uh, information here Elizabethans believed according to the ghost uh, sorry Elizabethans believed uh, according to the ghost Claudius killed him with no chance for his last rites so prayers before he dies so that he can go to heaven so uh, so his death brought about his eternal damnation which means his soul is caught in purgatory purgatory because his sins were not forgiven he wasn't given his last rites so he, he can never go to heaven he is doomed to walk for a certain time in purgatory this is an important point to note because a little bit later on this uh this idea this belief is going to prevent hamlet from acting in a um in a in a decision because he would be he's worried that this person will uh, not go to heaven. Yeah. Purgatory? purgatory is the belief that uh, when you don't go to heaven, there is a place in between. It's kind of like hell. You go to hell, and uh, the Elizabethans believed this, um, that purgatory is where you go until you can do some, um, you know, make it up, make amends somehow. Yeah. So that's where his father is saying he is. He's in purgatory. Pity me not, but lend thy serious hearing to what I shall unfold. Speak, I am bound to hear. So art thou to revenge when thou shalt hear. What? I am thy father's spirit, doomed for a 
sudden turn to walk the night. Plan for the day, confined to fast in fires, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. But that I am forbid to tell the secrets of my prison house, I could a tale unfold, whose lightest word would harrow up thy soul, freeze thy young blood, make thy two eyes like stars, start from their spears. Thy naughty and combined locks to part, and each particular hair to stand on end, like quills upon the fretful porter. So he says, I'm in purgatory, and it's worse than you think. I could tell you a story. It would, it would, um, it's worse than anything you've ever imagined. It will make your hair stand on end. It, you, it, it is, uh, it's a really scary place. But it, then he goes on to say, I'm not here to tell you the story of what purgatory is like. I want you to listen really closely to what I want you to do. And then he's going to go on to tell exactly how he died. But this eternal blaze must not be Years of fresh blood. Listen. List. Hamlet. Oh, list. If thou didst ever thy dear father love. Oh, God. Revenge his foul and most unnatural murder. Again here, unnatural murder, referring to the chain of being. Something has been disrupted in the chain of being. It's unnatural. Somebody killed him that shouldn't have. So it needs to be fixed if you want the whole world to be in harmony. Murder! Murder most foul, as in the best it is. But this most foul, strange. Haste, haste me to know it, that I with wings as swift as meditation or the thoughts of love may sweep to my revenge. Now this is ironic. He, the ghost is talking about foul. The murder is most foul, but this most foul, strange and unnatural. So referring to a uh, diseased or poisoned garden again, it's foul. Something is foul in the garden and unnatural. So it's uh, a little bit ironic. I'm not going to tell you why, but I'm, I'm going to just tell you that this is an ironic statement here that Hamlet says. He says, tell me quickly so that I know, so that I can get revenge for you as swift as, as with wings. Uh, my love for you will sweep me to revenge. I will do this so quickly for you, Father. Very important that we realize or that I tell you that that is ironic. I find the apt. And duller shouldst thou be than the fat weed that roots itself in ease on lethal wharf. Again, here he's saying, I, I'm not sure if you are up to it. It looks like you have, you're like a fat weed garden image that rots, that's been rotten uh, by the river of forgetfulness. Have you forgotten about me? I think you've forgotten about me. Thou not stir in this. Now, Hamlet, dear, it is given out that sleeping in my orchard, Garden, a image. serpent stung me. So the whole year of Denmark is by a forged process of my death rankly abused. But know thou noble youth, the serpent that did sting thy father's life now wears his crown. Oh, my prophetic soul, mine uncle. So he says here, oh, my prophetic soul. It implies that he had guessed the truth. 
but he didn't. He only felt some intuition here. So it's interesting. Um, but he, he definitely was suspicious of his of his uncle, right? Uh, that incestuous, that adulterous beast with witchcraft of his wits, with traitorous gifts. Oh, wicked wit, and gifts that have the power so to seduce. One to his shameful lust, the will of my most seeming virtuous queen. Again, seeming here, we have appearance versus reality. She seemed to love me. She seemed to be dedicated to me. So he is saying what seemed to be is now not. She seemed, but she jumped into that incestuous bed so quickly. Oh, Hamlet. What a falling off is there from me whose love was of that dignity that it went hand in hand even with the vow I made to her in marriage, and to decline upon a wretch whose natural gifts were poor to those of mine. But virtue, as it never will be moved, though lewdness caught it in the shape of heaven, so lust Though to a radiant angel it will sate itself in a celestial bed and prey on garbage. But soft, methinks I sent the morning's air. Brief let me be, sleeping within my orchard. My custom always in the afternoon. Upon my secure hour, thy uncle stole with the juice of cursed Ebenon in a vial. Poison! And in the porches of my ears did pour the leprous distillment, whose effect rolls such an enmity with blood of man that swift as quicksilver it courses through the natural gates and alleys of the body, and with a sudden vigor it doth pass it and curd, like eager droppings into milk, the thin and wholesome blood. So did it mine. And a most instant titter baked about, most lazar like, with vile and loathsome crust. All my smooth body. Thus was I sleeping by a brother's hand, blind, a crown, and queen at once dispatched. Cut off even in the blossoms of my sin, unhoused. Disappointed, on a kneel, no reckoning made, but sent to my account with all my imperfections on my head. So the ghost here is is referring to is um, saying to um, Hamlet, this is important that I have been sent to hell. This is my descent to hell. Here is significant because now. I will never go to heaven. He, him sending me, he sent me to hell by killing me. He did not let me have my last rites. Therefore, I can never be forgiven for my sins. Or uh, a little earlier on, it suggested he might, there might be an opportunity for him to be forgiven if what happened here in this world, in this life, gets purged out. So there's a possibility that he might be forgiven if whatever caused this destruction is purged from the country. Do you know what he did? Or? Um, Claudius? Yeah. He just went through it right now. So he just explained how he took poison and he poured it in his ear it, when he was sleeping in the back garden and the poison turned his body to scales and rotten. 
um, in his garden. Now that's important. His body turned like went rotten in the garden. Yeah. Um, didn't I say something about a snake? Is that what yeah, you're right. It's a, it's a, calling Claudius a snake, but it is. What were you gonna say? Nice. It is an allusion to the Garden of Eden. And it's contrasting the Garden of Eden with this garden. Nice, Sarah. Yeah? He did. Um, Sleeping in mine orchard, my custom always in the afternoon, upon my secure hour, my uncle stole the juice of heaven on in a vial, and in the porches of mine ears did pour. Yeah, he poured it in his ears. And he turned, he turned into like a leper, full of sores and, um, yeah. So, um, so this is important, that he reminds Hamlet of his descent to hell here uh, because he is now eternally damned because of it. No last rites. against their mother ought. Leave her to heaven and to those thorns that in her bosom lodge sting her. Very well at once. The glowworm shows the matin to be near and begins to pale is an effectual fire. Adieu. Adieu, Hamlet. So he has clear instructions for Remember Hamlet. Remember He has clear instructions for Hamlet here. I want you to make sure that Denmark is rid of the serpent but do not harm your mother. Let her own conscience get to her. Oh, oh, you host of heaven. Oh, earth. What else? And shall I couple hell? Oh, fine. Hold my heart. And you, my sinews, grow not instant old, but bear me stiffly up. Remember thee, I thou poor ghost, while memory holds a seat in this distracted glow. Remember thee, yea, from the table of my memory, I'll wipe away all trivial fond records, all sores of books, all forms, all treasures past, that youth and observation copied there, and thy commandment all alone shall live within the book and volume of my brain, unmixed with baser matter. From this point on, I'm not con going to concern myself with reading or any other thing that, uh, as a youth, I might be interested in my only focus is going to be thy commandment all alone shall live within me yeah we're um it's not exactly given i think he's around 18 or 19 oh. yeah okay yes yes by heaven oh most pernicious woman oh villain villain Smiling, damned villain. Okay, again, here we have appearance versus reality. This is an important thing that Hamlet realizes after speaking with the ghost, that people can look a certain way, but be serpents, be lying to, to your face. My tables, my tables. Meet it is, I set it down, that one may smile and smile and be a villain. Great quote. At least I'm sure it may be so in Denmark. So, uncle, 
there you are. Now to my word, it is adieu, adieu, remember me. I have sworn it. Meaning, I swear revenge. He, he swears that he will do this swiftly. Lord, my lord, Lord Hamley. Heaven's a curing. So be it. Hello. Hello. Oh, oh my lord. Hello. Oh, 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 boy, come back, come. How is my noble lord? What news, my lord? Oh, wonderful. Come, my lord, tell it. No, you'll reveal it. Not I, my lord, by heaven. Not I, my lord. How say you then would hard a man once think it? But you'll be secret. Aye, by heaven, my lord. There's ne'er a villain dwelling in all Denmark, but he's an arrant knave. There need no ghost, my lord, come from the grave to tell us this. Why, right, you're in the right. And so without more circumstance at all, I hold it fit that we shake hands and part. You as your business and desire shall point to you. For every man hath business and desire, such as it is. And for my own part, look you, I'll go pray. These are but wild and whirling words, my lord. I'm sorry they offend you heartily, yes, faith heartily. There's no offence, my lord. Yes, by St. Patrick, but there is, Horatio, and much offence, too. Touching this vision here, it is an honest ghost, that let me tell you. For your desire to know what is between us all, master it as you may. And now, good friends, as you are friends, scholars, and soldiers, grant me one poor request. What is, my lord? We will... Never make known what you have seen tonight. My lord, we will not. Nay, but swear it. In faith, my lord, not I. All right, my lord, in faith. Upon my sword. You swore, my lord, already. Indeed, upon my sword, indeed. Swear. Ah, boy, say so, so, up there, true penny. Come on. You hear this fellow in the cellarage? Consent to swear? Propose the oath, my lord. Never to speak of this that you have seen. Swear by my sword. Swear. Et ubi que, then we'll shift our ground. Come hither, gentlemen, and lay your hands upon my sword. Never to speak of this that you have heard. Swear by my sword. Swear. Well said, O mole, canst work it the ground so fast. O worthy pioneer, once more remove, good friends. Okay, so they ask him, what happened? What did he say to you? And all he says is, there is a villain dwelling in Denmark, a complete fool. So he doesn't tell any names. He, he, he's isolating himself even more. He's the only one who knows this information. So a little bit later on, he says, um, uh, those are wild and whirling words. So again, we see Horatio here isn't judging. He is an impartial observer, right? Um, and com commentator. Um, so. A little bit later on, Hamlet says, it is an honest ghost that I will tell you. Your desire to know what is between us, I'm not going to tell you. But swear to me, swear three times, that you will not talk about what went down tonight. Never make known what you have seen tonight. And he makes them swear it, hic e ubique, here and everywhere. You will not say it to anyone anywhere. Um, and then a little bit later on, take a look, line 163, Hamlet says, well said, old mole. So we know the mole, he's talking about his uncle, but they don't know that, right? He's the only one that knows it. Cats work in the ground so fast. Like, I'm going to get to you before you get to me. You can't work that fast, old mole. Um, so yes, so then he says, um, Horatio says, oh, day, night, this is wondrous, strange, hard to believe. And, um, but Hama says, oh, I believe in the supernatural. Uh, we don't know everything as humans. We aren't privy to the workings of the universe, right? So he says, yes, I do believe this ghost. Um, and then he says, allow, just after line 170, he says, from now on, I am going to put an act an antic disposition on. He's saying, I'm going to pretend to act insane. And he's going to do that to protect himself so that his uncle doesn't have any suspicions about him. So he's going to act, I'm going to put an antic disposition on that you, at such time seeing me, sh uh, never shall with arms encumbered thus or this head shake or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase. So he's saying, I'm going to act crazy, but you as my friends are never to call me on it, ever. Even mention, like, you know, in secret, don't ever mention that you know that I'm just acting crazy. And he makes them swear on that as well. Um, okay. 
A little bit later on, after line 185, um, he, he says to the ghost, I, I want you to rest. Uh, I hope that you can have um, a restful heart at some point. I'm going to make this right. The oh, let's. Oh dear night, but this is wondrous strange. And therefore, as a stranger, give it welcome. There are more things in heaven and earth, Horatio, than I've dreamt of in our philosophy. But yeah, so we don't know everything. Of course there might be ghosts, and I believe it. Come, here as before, never so help you mercy, how strange or odd, so e'er I bear myself, as I perchance hereafter shall think meet to put an antic disposition on, that you at such times see me never shall with arms encumbered thus, or thus head shake, or by pronouncing of some doubtful phrase, as well we know, or we could, and if we would, or if we list to speak, or there be, and if there might, or such ambiguous giving out to note that you know aught of me, this not to do, so grace and mercy at your most need help you swear. Okay, so again, that's where he's saying, look, doesn't matter how strange or odd I'm acting because I am going to put on an antic disposition. I'm going to pretend to be crazy. And then he says, don't ever make any, any comments to me like, okay, we're alone now. You don't have to act crazy. Don't ever say stuff like that to me because you never know who is watching, right? We know there's a spying motif here and uh, Hamlet is aware of it. I can never, we can never talk about this again. I'm telling you now, and we're never to talk about it again. Uh, swear. And then Hamlet says, rest, rest, perturbed spirit. With all my love, I do commend me to you. I love you so much. I can't believe how, um, how what a terrible situation Hamlet, old Hamlet, is in. Uh, what so poor a man as Hamlet is, he might be referring to himself as well, may do to express his love and friending to you. So he's saying, I'll do whatever I can to help you, but you have to swear to me that you will never tell anyone that I'm just acting crazy. Um, so, so yeah, so I may do to express his love and friending to you, God willing shall not lack. I'll do whatever it takes to help you out. Just do this for me. Let us go in together and still your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. Um, the chain of being, the time, the chain of being is out of order. And then he says, oh, cursed spite. He curses himself. My revenge is cursed that ever, that ever I was born to set it right. Um, so he says, oh, damn, that... It's on me, it's all on my shoulders to, to make this correct again, to fix the chain of being. Okay, so let's listen to how um, Hamlet uh, says it. Rest, man. Rest. Rest, perturbed spirit. So, gentlemen, with all my love, I do commend me to you. And what so poor a man as Hamlet is may do to express his love and friending to you, God willing, shall not lack. Let us go in together. And still your fingers on your lips, I pray. The time is out of joint. O oh, cursed spite that ever I was born to set it right. May come. Let's go together. All right. And that is the end there. So again, just to uh, just to reiterate, well, the time is out of joint, uh, referring to the chain of being. After talking with the ghost, he realizes he dare not trust anyone. Anyone. One may smile, smile, and be a villain. He realizes his position as son and heir means it is solely up to him to get justice and revenge. And not only that, he has promised his father that he will do it swiftly so that maybe his father can get out of purgatory, right? Okay, we'll finish off there and I want to hand back your... Uh, your Give him this money and... Your, uh, your unit test and uh, what I want you to do is rip off 
Rip off the last page. Write your name on it and hand it back to me. You can have like a minute to, uh, to just read over if you want. Um, so, Andrew? <coughs> Evan? <laughs> Jordan? So you're ripping off the last page and giving it back to me with your name on it. Jordan? So I can see your name on it. Yeah, Jordan? Yeah, When you get back, just give me that. Yeah. Okay. So. so you, wait, wait, wait. Like, is all the rooms classrooms? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, no, no, no. I have to like. Just, we have to do. Uh, family. Oh, no, that's during class. Okay. Yeah. Because. Taylor. Yeah, they go on the on the desk behind you, behind you. I mean. Okay, so let me just put this in. 